Hi, my name is Mark Bernat. I'm a monetary economist. In this video, I want to talk about the 2025 budget in Russia, what it means for the geopolitical implications for Ukraine, Russia, and the world, how realistic is it, and I'm going to back it up with numbers. Let's take a look at the numbers. The Russian budget is projected to be $140 billion for 2025 in terms of defense, and that's a 30% increase from 2024. However, if you take something called, or what, I don't know the translation exactly, how to translate it, but it's just internal defense forces, it is actually $440 billion, which is a 40% chunk of the entire Russian budget. So $440 billion, okay, I could equate it to ruble, but it would be in trillions of rubles. And really, it would be nonsensical because I want a universal unit of account. So if we have $440 billion in defense-related and defense in Russia right now in terms of the total budget, what is going to be their capacity to either increase or meet that budget through A, floating a bond, which we know is not a realistic situation. I would take Norwegian bonds all day long, wouldn't you? But I would never take a Russian bond. Nobody does. So they can't do it with debt. They can't do it with bonds. What about taxes? What about revenue? They've claimed that their revenue has increased 12%. But we know that's not true. Okay? If you, especially in real terms, with the price of oil going down consistently in real dollar times, as in an economist, you have to look at real dollars, you know that the real income is going down. Let's look how many households. There's 58.7 million households in Russia. Each earn $548 a month. That's, again, another decrease over the last month. $548 a month, and then if you multiply that by the number of households and then times it by 1.5, let's say in every household there's 1.5 wage earners, because usually if somebody stays home or somebody's doing something, you're at a $447 billion a month, which comes out to $577.75 billion a year. That's all the income total. This is based on Numbrio data, user input data, because we can't trust aggregate numbers or anything that comes out of Russia. But we can have some faith or trust in what users input over time. It's fairly consistent. It's fairly, you know, if you compare Numbrio to your own city, I think you'll be nodding your head yes. So what that means is if there's $578 billion the annual income produced in Russia based on Numbrio data and the number of households multiplied by 1.5. And even that's a stretch because I don't know if 1.5 people are working per household. A lot of the households are pensioners. A lot of the households might be students. And this needs to be carved out. So I would, I would uh, decrease it by a certain amount. And if $440 billion are for defense-related expenditures, that means... That's the entire wealth of the country. I mean, basically, people can't pay the rent. They have to be outside in a field, in grass, with their mouth open, collecting water, you know, to drink, and maybe eating grass. Hopefully, there's some insects in the grass. They get B12 and protein. A lot of vegans don't know this, that that's where they get their B12 and protein. And, you know, insect burgers, I, I hear they're looking into that into Russia because of food shortages. But, you know, I'm just joking a little bit, but not totally. Oh, but they spray everything in Russia because they claim they have the best pesticides in the world and try to export this stuff. So they're not very ecological, as it sounds, by eating insects. My point being, that's all the money for rent, for clothing, for transportation, for cell phones, for electricity, for water. It would all have to go into that $440 billion number. And correct me if I'm wrong. These are numbers that I've collected and data I've collected. I'm a data scientist. At the very minimum, it's $140 direct, but $440 billion indirect. So that leaves us with the PPC, Possibility Frontier, the trade-offs between guns and butter. It was very big. In the 1960s, guns were butter, and you got to make a trade. They can spend no money on infrastructure, no money on schools, no money on anything but their industrial complex of defense. So that means that there's no, no capital goods that are going to technology and productive sources. That is the cardinal sin of any kind of market is if you don't have any capital goods going and re being reinvested, 
And certainly at 19% interest rates, nobody's going to take out a loan and expect to make 25% profit at this time. Just like they're not going to buy a bond or a Russian bond. I won't buy it unless it's for, you know, novelty items so I can vector graphic tissue paper for the powder room, right? So by the numbers, there is no way that 578.75 equates to 440 billion if the total income of every single person in that was, you know, free democratic people's republic of Russia, I, I like you know, whatever it's called, that's farce. There's no way these two things equate. I've, I've been an accountant most of my life, an investment accountant as well as an economist and a monetary economist. And in every situation, whenever I see that, this disharmony, that's a toxic, that, that's, that's cooking the books, that's toxic. So what's going to happen? I've had some predictive models that uh, put Russia's end economically in the total end of this geopolitical conflict at the end of 2026, but already I'm starting to accelerate those. I put it over 50% in mid-2025 that this can't be sustained. Everything about Russia is unsustainable, and it doesn't add up. I think this is their last bluff, their last way to say that Russia big, Russia strong, but it really isn't. And in my previous videos, I show that it's not really even comparable to the Netherlands in terms of strength of economics. I'd buy a Netherlands bond all day long, okay? I'd take Euro all day long. I'd take Polish Zlata all day long, but I would not take Russian ruble or a Russian bond or have any credence in what they say. Now, there are some apologist economists maybe in the media that are saying, you know, still touting the tune that, okay, Russia's in a position that they may be able to negotiate in 2025. That window has closed. They, they want, if they wanted to play that card, they would have played it. And they don't because they know that window has closed because the numbers don't add up. If you've got, you gotta, if you've got 58 million people in Russia, households in Russia contributing, it would be 100% basically to this 578.75. That's the, of that going to 440. Yeah, 548. Okay, so 440 of total defense budget. Okay, the numbers are kind of blurring right now. I have to sometimes check this. Now, this was similar to what happened in Germany in the 1930s. The H guy, the Tsar of Germany, overheated the economy. A lot of people don't know this. And it was about to collapse. The German economy was about to collapse, so they turned on the you know machine that supposedly greases everything, uh, that geopolitical is that. And that's what Russia did. The Russian economy was not that strong. This Primea 2014 became a unifying, you know, aspect that they said, okay, we Russians are imperialists now again. And they've been playing this card and building that defense up, but that card can only last for so many years. So expect in 2025, although my initial projection is 2026, in 2025, if all goes well, there will no, be, no longer be Russia as we know it. It will collapse. It will collapse on economics. And ask yourself, would you take the ruble? Would you take a Russian bond? And do you believe the numbers and things coming out of Russia? And you can compare that to the data, a Numbrio data. You can compare it to how much people make. You can't tax the people. You can't squeeze blood out of a stone. You cannot just not do it if 100% of their income is going to this quote-unquote defense. It's pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It just can't happen. So that's good news for Ukraine. You guys hold tight. My name is Mark Bernat. I'm a monetary economist. Have a great day. Thank you very much.